We're going to just change tone a little, Grant, and uh, introduce Grant Sarah, who we spoke about yesterday as one of the award winners. But Grant is a psychiatrist with roles in clinical care and data, associate professor at the University of New South Wales, and associate professor at the University of Sydney as well. He's involved with caring for young people with recent onset of psychosis and director of Inform. Uh, Grant's going to talk to us about building data to support action on physical health gaps. So welcome, Grant, and thank you very much. I'll try and do it from here, I think. Is, is this one? So while that's all coming up, yeah, look, I, I did want to just start by thanking everyone for being here on a Thursday morning at the end of a long conference after a lot of words and a lot of PowerPoint slides. Um, and, and also very much like to thank you, Emily, for your presentation, a very thoughtful and very personal presentation. It's a bit daunting to follow that with a really abstract presentation about population data. Um, and uh, that might feel like the last thing you need on a Thursday morning rather than the, the, the first thing. Um, but look, I, I do think one of the themes and one of the strengths of the, the conference and, and of Equally Well really is that in tackling these big problems, we need a whole range of perspectives. And I really like your thoughtful multi-axial kind of approach to, to um, thinking about it. And hopefully this kind of population lens um, shouldn't be seen as a better lens, but just another lens, a different lens for trying to tackle these things. And clearly change needs a system view and a personal view and everything in between. Um, yes. I will, thank you. No, that's good. So, are we all good? And, uh, we'll just get the slides up on the screen. Great. Um, so, let me get the technology working here. Should never let old baby boomers near technology. Uh, okay, how do we progress, eh? Try to clicker. There we go. Um, yeah, so just to start by acknowledging um, the Gadigal people on whose lands we meet and pay respect to their elders past and present and emerging and any, any First Nations people here in the audience today. And also to acknowledge that in the data we present, we're really looking at data from many thousands of people who've used New South Wales mental health services. Um, and that we're very conscious when we do so that we need to do so with, with, uh, with we do it with gratitude and we, and we do it with respect and we do it very much with the goal of trying to improve care um, and, and uh, in our services. So um, everyone in this room knows, sound no good still? Okay. Might need a hand mic. Okay, let's try that. Two hands here. Um, so, um, look, I think everyone in this room knows there's a really important gap. Uh, you know, that's why we're here, the, the, the physical health gap. Um, and I guess we also know not only that the gap is there, but that it's got really complex causes. Um, and uh, this is a, um, uh, from a recent um, paper in, in Lancet Psychiatry called Gone Too Soon, and it's sort of laying out priorities for actions. There's many different frameworks, and I wasn't going to go through any of the text in the boxes, but just to me, it kind of visually makes the point that all those blue boxes are risk factors and mechanisms, that the causes are complex and the interactions between those causes are complex. Um, and, and the strategies that we need to collectively implement are also complex. There's no one cause, there's no one strategy. Um, there's a whole lot of strategies at lots of different levels. Um, and in that sense, as well as the health gap, we've got an evidence gap because, again, we all know there's lots of evidence that we have a problem and that it's a, the scale of the problem is substantial. But what we've got less evidence about is the kind of evidence that lets us unpick some of those causes and plan and monitor the strategies. So data about um, the mechanisms, data about the service models that work better than others, and data to really um, prompt action and change in services, in health systems, and to monitor that change. Um, and, and also that even in any individual small health system, there's still a diversity of experience, a diversity of issues and the strategies that are needed. So to really allow us to, to focus in and, and design strategies that, that work for different groups of people. Um, so what I wanted to do in this presentation was to um, touch on four things, just to tell you briefly about the Mental Health Living Longer project, which is our attempt to marshal the data in New South Wales to help support these kind of efforts, to, to go through a couple of specific findings in a few areas just to give a flavour for the kind of data, and then 
talk about how we're trying to bring that data together to report to services and help support change efforts, um, and then talk about next steps and some of the big data gaps um, that, that are constantly there and we're constantly still trying to chip away at. Um, so what Mental Health Living Longer is, it's a data linkage project. Um, health systems and governments collect a lot of data and we're really trying to make use of all of the data we can um, that's available to us in New South Wales. So on the left there, you've got a whole range of data collections, um, our health service data, mental health community teams, hospitals, emergency departments, but also data about physical health, cancer screening registers, um, and, and a range of other uh, data, some, some that we already have, some that we're just on the threshold of getting, like vaccination and uh, notifiable conditions. Um, and then we bring that data together. Um, it's linked by the New South Wales uh, Cheryl, the, the uh, Health Records Linkage Agency. Um, and we've got data not just on people who use mental health services, but on the whole New South Wales population. So we can understand where the gaps are greatest and where the differences in, in, in care and outcomes are greatest. We organise the work around four different themes, um, all-cause mortality, suicide, cancer, and medical and surgical care. And with the goal, really, that there's a research component to what we're doing, and we've got research ethics approval from um, the New South Wales Population Health Ethics Committee and the, and the AH and MRC. Um, but our goal is primarily not just to be a research project, it's to really drive change and support policy and change and improvement within New South Wales health. Um, we've got a project governance committee um, with representation, uh, in, in, so the steering committee involves the, the policy parts of the ministry. It, it, it involves many of the agencies responsible for care and improvement um, that, that need to be the partners in change. And, and uh, I won't read through them all, but to highlight one as an example, Cancer Institute New South Wales have been really strongly engaged and supportive of the work. Um, and I'll show you some, some uh, findings there. Um, we've got uh, consumer and carer uh, um, representation in the steering committee uh, through, through our peak bodies uh, for mental health consumers and carers, and also the um, health, carers, uh, sorry, health consumers New South Wales um, and the New South Wales Mental Health Commission involved. We have Aboriginal Sovereign Steering Committee, uh, we have a, an academic, academic advisory group, and we've got a small project team, and I'll come back to the project team at the end. Um, but really, in terms of data, um, if, if we pick up a, a paper and look at uh, um, you know, studies in, in the sort of large epidemiological studies, they, they tell us there's a problem, but they don't give us the kind of data that we need for change. Um, and really, uh, for, for data to be um, help, helpful in driving change, it's got to have a few attributes. And it's got to be, ideally, we need data that's actionable, so data about things that we can make a difference to. You know, life expectancy is a critical measure, but it's difficult to act on directly. You know, we, there's, there's things, you know, we need to find those um, data points that tell us about things that we can, we can change. Ideally, it should be recent. It's certainly a challenge with this kind of data that often we're dealing with long time lags and that definitely affects our data. But we want it, the data to be as recent as possible. We want it to be as local as possible. And certainly it's an issue, um, you know, I think we're all guilty and certainly in services, you know, very guilty of looking at a national figure and saying, well, that can't apply to us. You know, we know that's different in our service. So local data really is, is, is critical for engaging services in, in in change, and it's got to be detailed. It's got to tell us as much as we can about not just where, but who, um, and, and uh, so that we can plan action. Um, so we're, in terms of picking data and trying to focus on what we've got, partly we've been driven by the data sets we've got and trying to work you know, from them. But we've really tried to prioritise data that has some of these kind of attributes and very much on that prevention of things that are in the influence of health services, because that's really our scope. There's a whole lot, obviously, of social determinants um, that are equally critical, but they're very hard things for health services by themselves to, to change. So they haven't been the central focus of our reporting, even though they're critical parts of the problem. So um, these are some of the examples, I won't read through them all, but these are some of the examples of the types of things where it's, it's possible to see how services and health systems can kind of act on those things. Um, you know, prevention activities like cancer screening and vaccination or um, aspects of access to or, or quality of, of specialist care. And I'll walk through a couple of these now. So yeah, in these, in these areas here of, um, uh, that are listed there, so the first um, area to talk about is just uh, we've been looking at cancer screening um, and uh, the data for cancer screening is best where there's those big national screening programs um, we, and we've, so far we've looked at um, cervical cancer and breast cancer because those were the available data sets. We've got um, bowel cancer data, uh, screening data um, yet to, to come. 
Um, and what we found, um, we looked at the two-year screening participation rate in, um, in women who use mental health services in New South Wales. In the population, and in all of these slides, the blue is going to represent the population rate in New South Wales, and the orange is going to represent the rate in our mental health service users. Um, and uh, have I got a laser here? It's probably not going to help anyway. Um, but yes, you can see there's a gap there. 40%, only 40% of our mental health service users had had recent cervical cancer screening compared to 54% of other women of the same age in New South Wales. Um, so that's a rate ratio, a kind of, if you look at those rates, adjusted for age and sex and disadvantage um, of uh, 0.74. Um, now, that might not look like a big gap, but um, we estimate that that's about 16,000 people, that gap. So if we could bring that screening rate up uh, to the, um, the rate of the rest of the population, that would be an additional 16,000 people that would be screened. Um, and, uh, and we know that screening um, reduces your risk of mortality from cervical cancer by a half if, you know, if you're a participant in screening. Um, so again, that's a population-wide figure. Zooming in a bit on the WHO, um, we, we looked at this by age, um, and, uh, and one of the unexpected and really striking findings was a very kind of, um, uh, yeah, an unexpected age pattern. So you can see that what you've got age groups across um, the bottom there, and you can see that in, in younger women um, who use our mental health services, screening rates are fairly close to that of the general population, about 5 to 10% lower. But um, in women from 30 onward, um, it reduced, and then particularly in mental health service users aged 60, 65, um, the rates were really, really low. Um, and we're doing some more work at the moment to try and understand that. There's several possible explanations for that. Um, you know, so, for example, we know since the introduction of the HPV vaccination, you know, that perhaps there's a cohort of younger women who are much more aware of, of, um, of, of the need for screening uh, related to that. There's, there's, we're still wanting to look at that. Um, but in terms of where services could look, perhaps this could be a prompt to say, as services, we need to be thinking about that. Is this something we're asking in our routine screening with people about their physical health care? Um, and particularly in services looking um, after older women. Um, going to that issue of local data, um, part of what we're trying to do is feed this data back to local services. So um, in New South Wales, services are organised into local health districts. They've got slightly different names in different states. Um, and so here you've got data on each of our 15 geographical local health districts in the state. Um, and I haven't named them here, um, but in the reporting back to them that we do, we do give them this data in an identified way. And what you can see, the blue dot is the population rate. So you can see that for the overall population, there's quite a difference in screening rates across the state. Um, and the, the sites with the highest screening rates there are really um, in eastern Sydney and in coastal New South Wales. And the lowest screening rates are in western Sydney um, and in uh, some of the western parts of New South Wales. The orange dots here are the screening rates in the mental health service users in each of those LHDs, and the grey bar is therefore the gap. And you can see that um, there's a gap across the state, um, no matter where you are. Um, the gap varies, and in some areas, you can see a couple of LHDs there in the middle where the gap's actually quite small, where, where mental health service users still have a gap, but it's less than uh, in, in many other areas and closer to the population rate. So. Um, this, and hope, you know, the hope is that this is data that helps prompt LHDs um, to, to make local inquiries, try and understand what's going on in their own region, um, and also perhaps to not be, um, uh, to, to, to be aware of those differences. So for example, if we were to just say to the first LHD at the top, you know, your screening rate is 46%, that's above average for mental health service users in the state, they might say, well, we've got no problem then, you know, we're, we're doing really well, whereas you can see they're not doing very well compared to the rest of their population. So there's a systematic gap there, even though, um, you know, so it's trying to give a, a relevant comparison point. Uh, this is data on breast screening, um, and the, the story is very similar. Um, so we've got um, in, the, in um, uh, women aged 50 to 74, which is the target age range for the breast screen um, uh, pop, uh, program, 53% um, of the New South Wales population is screened. Uh, through mammography, only 30% of mental health service users in that age group. Um, and uh, so uh, a rate ratio of 0.57. So um, similarly, this is the same kind of graph. You can see in, in this, in, in the broader population, if you just focus on the blue dots for a moment, the LHDs at the top there are mainly rural and regional. So screening rates are actually 
at a population level higher in rural and regional New South Wales. Um, there's um, a, the breast screen programs very much run through those vans in the road uh, that, that kind of are visible and and kind of there's good community awareness and support um, and and so screening rates are higher in the in the rural LHDs um, and again you can see there's gaps right across the board but the gaps do vary from from LHD to LHD. So that's two two areas of cancer screening. I want to move to talk about preventable hospitalizations. Um, so we looked at some data on um, about 180,000 people who had used our community mental health services over two years um, and looked at overall preventable hospitalizations. So preventable hospitalizations, uh, hospitalizations, it's a set of conditions defined um, by the um, National Quality and Safety Commission where with good integrated care, good primary care, most of these or many of these should be able to be avoided. So it's an indirect measure of how well is the primary care and the preventative care system working for you um, or for your region. Um, and so um, the, these are the set of conditions. There's about 21 conditions grouped into three groups. Chronic conditions um, like uh, chronic airways disease and diabetes, acute conditions like asthma uh, and infections, um, and vaccine preventable conditions. So we found that People with mental health uh, who, who use our mental health services were 2.6 times as likely to have an admission, um, about tw had more admissions per person, and ended up therefore, and, and stayed longer, and so in hospital, and therefore were impacted with more than five times the number of bed days um, than other New South Wales residents of the same age. Um, so these blue bars here are what you would expect if our mental health service users had um, admissions to hospital at the same rate as uh, uh, other New South Wales residents, um, that's what you would expect to see. What we saw instead was this. Um, so all of those orange bars are essentially excess bed days. That's you know, the impact on individuals. Um, and what really struck us in this data is um, the, um, the, the areas where it was greatest. Now, some of them are sadly probably um, uh, expected to people in this audience who are kind of informed about the scale of the problems and the type of problems. So you can see at the top there, chronic obstructive airways disease, diabetes complications, um, cellulitis and infections. But what really struck us also was down here at the bottom, vaccine preventable conditions, which I guess was something that we didn't expect to see at quite that scale. Um, so that, we, that prompted us to do some more work, which I'll come to in a second. So just to underline those impacts, um, in this study, 2% of the New South Wales population were in our mental health service cohort users. So we know our state and territory mental health services see about 2% of the, of the population each year. Um, but if we look at hospital bed days in New South Wales for any of these conditions, um, about 9% of overall preventable uh, hospitalisation bed days was in our mental health cohort. You can see that 15% of vaccine preventable bed days um, was in, in this cohort, 12% of diabetes complication bed days, um, and also unexpected, not a huge number of people, but proportionally huge difference, nearly a third of hospital bed days for nutritional deficiency. Um, and that's something we're doing some more work on that's prompted some work with Scott Teasdale and, uh, and Patrick uh, Gould uh, working together um, to, to look at some more work on that at the moment. To the vaccine preventable conditions, which is you know, um, we've been keen to look at, which is one of those areas where it's possible to really um, see room for prevention, room for action. Um, so what we found was that really the, the bottom line was that people who used our mental health services had uh, more than three times the risk of admission for vaccine preventable hospitalizations. Um, we looked at about um, 17 or 18 different vaccine preventable conditions in three groups, respiratory conditions like flu and COVID, um, uh, hepatitis B, and a range of other conditions. <coughs> Excuse me. Um, and you can see here the orange bar is the rate per thousand people um, in the mental health service users. The blue is the, the rate in the New South Wales uh, population. And the, the kind of ratios of those are shown below. The, the light grey bar is just if you just simply divide them. But because mental health service users in this you know, um, group were younger than the New South Wales population when we adjust for age, that's the darker grey bar. So that's the 3.2 times extra risk. <coughs> um, now this is that same comparison of our local health districts for that measure. So here, 
the left-hand side is you, you want the rate to be low, not high. With screening, we wanted it to be high. Um, but here, we want the rate to be low. Um, and you can see that um, in, if you just look at the blue dots for a moment, the highest rates of vaccine-preventable hospitalisations in the general population are in the city um, and lower rates in the rural LHDs. But you can see there's gaps in all areas, and it varies. You know, if, and at, in some LHDs, it's as, as high as nearly four times the rate in mental health service users compared to other members um, um, of the population. The other th theme of the data about trying to not just say where but who and which, which groups should we be trying to focus on supporting better is really the issue of age. And I'd say that one really recurring theme in our data is not just that risks are increased, but that the risk curve has shifted left, that, that people are at much greater risk uh, of, of a, the whole range of physical health issues at a younger age, and particularly um, people who use mental health services in their 30s, 40s and 50s are at dramatically higher risk for a range of things, including vaccine-preventable hospitalisations. So the main thing to focus on in this graph is just the shape of these curves. If the risk was the same, um, each of those curves would be kind of symmetrical. The blue side and the orange side would look the same, but clearly they don't. The risks are much higher and they bulge out there in people in their 40s and 50s. And you can see that's what those grey bars on the right are showing. They're showing that in, in that age group, so for example in men in their 40s and 50s um, who use mental health services, the risk of vaccine preventable hospitalisation was about six times the rate of other men of the same age. So really, again, perhaps leading to areas we could try and target to help provide better support. Um, so just to um, quickly talk about, because I've just flashed up a whole lot of slides at you and, and probably, you know, it's hard to keep track of all of those findings. And if we're doing that to our health services, part of the dilemma for them is, well, what should I pay attention to? What, where, where should I focus in trying to make improvements? Um, so we're trying to bring this data together in a way that supports change. Um, and as part of that, we're trying to um, develop these sort of integrated physical health, mental health report cards um, that combine those measures. So um, what this is, is um, an example of that. So we, here's on the left, you'll see there's a range of measures there. I'm not sure whether you can read the, them at the back, but we've got life expectancy, breast and cervical screening, um, preventable hospitalizations, overall acute and chronic, and some vaccine preventable admissions. So um, they're uh, examples of what we've got currently. The blue line down there is the, is the New South Wales average. The orange dot is the average for um, uh, mental health service users across the state. So that's that gap that we've been looking at. And you can see what we've done is we've just standardised the scores, so statistically adjusted them so that they can all be shown on the same scale. And we've also flipped it so that um, you're not having to think, well, hang on, for some things good is bad and so high is good and some things low is good. So we flipped it so that the good direction is to the right, better health to the right, worse health to the left. And then for each individual LHD, we can then drop that LHD on that graph. So here's one LHD, and this is showing, for example, an LHD whose overall life expectancy at the top there, that blue dot, is quite close to the... Um, uh, the, the New South Wales population average, their breast screening rates and cervical screening rates are above average and they're below, slightly below average on um, preventable hospitalisations. But if we look at their mental health service users in orange, you can see there's some substantial gaps. In some things, they, the gap is lower than um, in some other parts of this, the state, but in some, it's more. So, for example, in screening. So, um, it's a way of trying to give local health services a bit of a kind of focus area to say, well, where am I doing well? Where am I doing least well? Um, both are worth investigating. Um, and I guess the other thing I'd say is that, in general, just sending reports out to local health districts doesn't tend to immediately produce change. You know, most services are bombarded with reports. So really, at the moment, we're trying to produce these reports, but also have a process of going out and presenting um, that data to services. And, and, and overall, um, uh, you know, many of them have found it really interesting and, and, uh, and, and engaged with it very well. Um, our goal over the next year is to keep filling in those reports and keep filling in the data. So this is, um, you know, so that we can try and really build up a proper suite of measurements that involve both the processes of care and the outcomes of care across that spectrum from prevention through to care and outcomes. The things in black are the things that we've kind of got the data for now. Um, the things in red are the things that we're still working on. 
and, uh, but with, with hope to get soon. So just um, to f one minute, okay. Um, just a, a couple of, um, uh, th there's a few areas here um, that, uh, oh, John's given me the green light, you, that's, you're in trouble. Three minutes, okay, I'll move quickly. Look, just to briefly say, I'll just highlight this as one area that we're working on at the moment. Um, access to surgery is an area that really hasn't been discussed much in this conference. It's a really neglected area in, in looking at this whole issue of physical health care, and yet we use surgical access as a measure of our health system all the time. I mean, surgical waiting lists are on the front page of papers. Um, there's, there's reasons to think that um, people living with chronic um, mental health conditions might have both more need for surgical care, but also less access. And so we've been trying to look at, at that. And, and um, what we've found is that uh, overall in New South Wales, um, uh, that people with, uh, who, who use our mental health services are about 20% more likely to have any surgery, um, but much more likely, nearly four times as likely to have emergency surgery. Um, so there's a very different mix of planned and emergency surgery. Um, and when we look at it and break down a bit more, um, what we've got here is some procedures that the AHW uses as kind of sentinel procedures as measures of surgical access. At the top there, there's a group where you can see lots of pink. They're all the surgeries where the, both the planned and the emergency surgery rates are higher. That's coronary artery grafting, um, coronary angioplasty, gallbladder surgery, appendix, emergency surgery, surgery which in our health system there is at least some level of free access to if in a life-threatening situation. Um, the ones at the bottom, where you've got blue, the rates are significantly lower, um, and that's cataract surgery, knee replacement, hip replacement, things that are chronic and disabling and you know, have a big impact on your life, but there's big financial barriers. Largely, you've got to have financial, uh, you've got to have private insurance to access or to access quickly. So I think there's a real story that we're trying to unpack in this um, surgical data about the impact of uh, financial barriers and access to surgery and perhaps some of the impact of insurance. So that's a bit of a watch this space for another issue that I think we should be looking at. I'm going to flick over that because of time um, and just finish off with some of those limitations. So I've mentioned, I think, why we're not focusing on life expectancy. We are trying to measure it, we are trying to report it, but we're not seeing it as the most important measure. Um, there's a big gap for us in the linkage with national data. You know, we know, all know that it's how our health system works together. Um, uh, th there are some alternatives. There is progress in linking national data, but it is always painfully slow. And, and so we're, that's, we're very mindful of that gap. There are big gaps in our New South Wales data. Um, and, uh, yeah, and I think that's you know, some of the really rich kind of um, material that, that we heard about in, in Emily's presentation. Our data is very poor at capturing gender, sexuality, culture, um, those things. You know, there are small steps towards improving it, but that's going to be a long, slow road to get our big um, juggernaut data collections to, to capture those well. Um, and even, and this probably isn't as true in some other states, but in New South Wales, we don't have central access to medications, observations, pathology investigations. Those would clearly add a lot to this kind of data. Um, we're you know, working away at trying to get that, um, but that's not in our big central data warehouses. And the other thing I'd say is the data is only ever data um, and it doesn't lead to change by itself and it needs much broader support. So I just wanted to finish, because John's given me the wind up here, um, just to thank our, um, I've mentioned the team, I just particularly wanted to thank our project team because we don't have any additional resources for this. This isn't a kind of big externally funded project. This is, you know, in the spirit of collective impact, this is, um, uh, we, we just, um, our data team has a number of people we've just ad allocated part of our work to do this um, and, uh, and we've been very lucky to have uh, a range of really excellent students and, and fellows we've worked with so I'd acknowledge um, Patrick Gould who's with us on a Hedy Fellowship Andy Davies down here at the front who's joined us as a, a part of his um, uh, medical studies um, uh, who've kind of sustained this work I'll stop there thank you thanks Ryan fantastic um, we have got time for just one or two quick questions so I apologise that running slightly slow on a Thursday morning, but it's not bad for last morning of a conference. Don't that. Um, Grant, thanks for mentioning the ability to capture uh, intersectionality, you know, and building on uh, Emily's. Uh, but I think my question is a summary question. If you were the boss of New South Wales Health and you were lining up all the, the chief executives of all the local health districts, what would, you, <laughs> what would you tell them in terms of a start now, get onto it, and, and also a long-term priority? 
what, what would you get, say, get onto this right now, and another one, what's one, the one to focus on the long term? Wow, that's a good question. I mean, I, I, I'm not trying to dodge the question, but I do think partly the message of the data is there's no one solution everywhere. So I do think start now needs to be look at your data um, and because your data already shows that you're dealing with this now. You know, if you go back to those pie charts, you know, if, if one in eight people sitting in your diabetes wards have complications and they're a person who's also had contact with mental health services, you are already dealing with this, you're just not dealing with it well. So, you know, look at where you've already got scope to, to act. Yeah, I think would be my... One up there, last one. No, no, we are people online, we need to use the microphone oh, for you. Right. Hi, I'm from a CMO, Laura Collister, Wellways Australia. Um, I guess in this whole conversation, this data is just mind-blowing to me. And it seems that the CMOs could have a really important role in the screening and the vaccination yes. rates. Yes. We deal with people who are probably in less acute distress or at times of less acute distress, which may be the ideal opportunity to get people involved in vaccination programs, screening programs. Yes. And it sort of hasn't been mm -hmm. part of the conversation and I'm not sure if this data is readily available to the CMOs. So. Um, yeah, look, I mean, I agree. I think the CMOs, because the data sort of speaks to the need for change. It doesn't speak to what that change should look like and how it should be designed. And I think, you know, if, in terms of vaccination, in terms of some of the exercise, I can see Jen at the back there. Um, so, uh, the, the yeah, there's, there's, I think there's a lot of work where local LHDs, and I mean, ideally what we'd want to see this data used as is supporting local improvement efforts. So if, a, if an LHD you know, in partnership with a CMO was wanting to implement some screening or exercise or whatever the outcome, you know, whatever the process was, then ideally we should be making sure there's a data system there that helps them target it and then monitor what's changed. Yeah. All right, we'll take one more then. That'll be it. But no, you'll need to use the mic, just one. Dave's running towards you. <laughs> So Linda Walton from Mental Health Carers, New South Wales. Yes. Um, a lot of the issues here for me on the ground and, and seeing there's so much wonderful stuff coming out there that's not actually getting into the thick of it. Consumers who are not accessing services don't even are not even included in the data. And it seems to me there could be some really good collaboration between really initiative, uh, really motivated software companies, of which I know quite a few, that are focused on the information being owned by the consumer, who that travels with the consumer, that the consumer um, owns, that makes a lot more sense and enables the capacity for the consumer to be in control of their data and ensure what's important is not lost. Yeah, look, I mean, I think absolutely agree with you that that could be a really effective type of tool. I think we need more focus on that. But look, I, I think also partly, you know, you're correct, the data is only ever just the data and, and you know, change and, and, it, and it only does reflect the people who are seeing the services. So, so yes, uh, you know, the, the actual work of trying to get the material out to people in a way that's going to make a difference, that's going to improve that. That's the really hard work that everyone in the room is doing. Yeah, and this is just one sort of strand to help support that work. So. Yeah. Thanks, Grant. Listen, thank you very much, Grant. And uh, list, uh, please join with me in thanking both our speakers this morning. We've had a fantastic and stimulating morning. So it's great.